Hello and welcome to episode 6 of How Would You Run That? A Dungeons and Dragons podcast and ideas factory with me, Lucas Tomlinson. And me, Jake Kanner. In this podcast, we'll be discussing some aspect of Dungeons and Dragons. An encounter, location, trap, puzzle, NPC, PC, god, magic item, or really anything that can exist in the world of Dungeons and Dragons. Importantly, we'll then be asking each other the question, how would you run that? At the end of each episode, one of us will reveal the topic for the next week, giving us a week to prepare, research and plan how we'd run said thing. This episode is on a green slard. Jake, a green slard, how would you run that? As is now customary, I will tell you in a minute, because first I must ask you, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. It's been... I'll tell you why I've been very well. Because the weather is nice, and it's such right? a ridiculously, stupidly small thing, but like... The fact that it's been sunny outside has cheered me up dramatically in the last week. Everyone's Instagram has been identical, just like, big grins, smile, <laughs> there's, there's weather that's not just <laughs> rain and sadness. Well, yeah, so it's just, yeah, just feeling really chipper. Like, looking Good. forward to the weekend, spend some time in the sun. I, uh, I, I caught our cat sunbathing in the bathroom. There's like a mm-hmm. small spot where, when the sun comes around, so at midday, it shines just next to the toilet, and that's the best place to lay down in the bathroom. Good to know. Next time mm. I need to have a nap in your bathroom. Yeah, just, just go <laughs> next to the bowl. <laughs> How are you, Jake? How you been? I'm good. I had a couple of days off this week. I finished Cyberpunk. Really enjoyed oh. it. I don't know much about Cyberpunk. I guess I know enough. Uh, which story did you follow? There are, there are a few different like tracks, aren't there? Uh, there are, and it's not huge spoilers at this point, so it kind of doesn't matter. Um, you have mm. a few little starting... Three different ways to start. You kind of start as a street kid, you know, a city kid of the streets. Um, <laughs> clues in the name, who knew? <laughs> you can start as a nomad, yeah. who are like the people who don't live in the city. They are nomads but they're all like tech nomads they've got cool cars and rvs and tech and stuff mm. um or corpo which is like your business person and so like middle class society in yeah. there for making money and in with the corporations the corporations are basically taken well, not even taken over but they kind of surpass governments the corporations are big big deals you know the kind of way facebook's heading right now amazon that sort of thing yeah yeah but if you're in with the corp then they are your family they look after you and which uh, which one did you go for I did Street Kid because I wasn't going to okay. be no corpo trash, and I didn't. I was a toss up between Nomad and Street Kid, but I went Street Kid. And all that mm. really makes a difference on is like the first half hour, like the intro, prologue sort of thing. Oh, is the rest of the game the same otherwise? Basically, yeah. Gotcha. Because I've, I've seen a couple of Let's Plays um, doing it, and they've both gone the corporate route. Oh, really? So I've seen that introduction twice. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> played slightly differently, but I don't know. <laughs> I've not really followed it to see where the story goes on after that. Right. Um, yeah, okay, interesting. I would recommend not if you've got a regular base level PlayStation, although they are working on it. Um, I did see some funny things on Reddit. Yeah, it was, it was like the PS4 version. Not good. It's it's a shame all around because this game's been super hype since what 2013 mm. when they announced it, and Keanu Reeves mm. is in there and he's fully mocap and the voices, him. and he's just a wonderful human. So, yeah. Anyway, what I would say is maybe wait until they've released a couple more patches to make it stable on general <laughs> systems and stuff but yeah it was good it's a, a good romp it was a good open world rpg plenty of stuff to do so much so that because you can sort of see when the final mission's coming up i did that classic thing like, i must do all the side quests to make sure i milk yes. all the content out of this to the point where it, the map must be cleared yeah yeah so we're we doing a second podcast then to talk about other stuff yeah a second podcast where i just talk about my gripes with open world game maps <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, long story short, do play. It was good. It looks beautiful, but I'm a sucker for a cyberpunk setting anyway. That sort of futuristic tech. Love it. Nice. Right, should we crack on then? Yeah, you probably should. Nice. So, a green slard, Jake. How would you run that? Right. Tell me tell me how you're going to run Kermit the Frog in Finding. <laughs> Hi-ho, this is the green slard. <laughs> <laughs> He says telepathically. Yeah, that's it. He speaks only slow. Okay, quick old rundown. So the Sladi have been around since like D&D version 1.0. They've been around since well, first edition in basically the same guises. There are a few different colors. Uh, you've asked me specifically about the green, but there are red and blue flavors. Green is like a cut above. Then you've got 
black, which is like the death sladi, which is what the green wants to become if it can. Mm. And then there are a couple of sladi lords who are on top of that. All that really matters is they are like chaos frogs. Yep. Is kind of what it comes down to. And they have somewhat different motivations, but also their, their, their core being is we live on the plane of chaos, the elemental plane of nothing makes sense, but because they're native to that plane, they can shape it to their will and they can survive there. They also are sown across the world, and when they end up in somewhere like the material plane, they are primarily there to you know, fuck shit up. They're there to mm. sow some chaos, and well, that's it. That's what they do. Yeah. Giant chaotic frogs. I think you hit, you hit the first sentence, sort of hit it off. That's, that's what they are. Yeah. But we're talking specifically about a green slard, which yes. is a magically imbued slard. That's right. So it has innate mm. spellcasting abilities. It doesn't need a focus or a wand or a staff or anything. It's got some cool other little features about it. You can find it on page 277 of your monster manual. Um, but there are plenty of online resources if you don't have access to the monster manual as well. That will bring it out for you for the dms out there you know the people who are using this podcast for better and for worse it's a challenge rating eight monster and as such you expect it to be a big old beefy critter but it's not it has um ac 16 it's only natural armor doesn't wear stuff average hit points 127 which isn't loads and loads and loads but as you write the hit on the head it's danger is more about the fact that it is a magically imbued innate spell casting chaotic mother hubbard i would say on just on the health thing it does have resistance to a lot of kind of damages it does which makes it a bit tougher maybe if you're thinking those hit points aren't enough yeah you're right it's got a whole bunch of resistances and they are in particular to magic and then it's advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects it is resistant to acid cold fire lightning thunder you'll notice in there not bludgeoning, not piercing. Yeah. So martial characters actually have a better time if they can get up in this thing's uh, personal space and do some damage. Mm. Your spellcasters will be frustrated at range. I mean, everyone's going to be frustrated when it regenerates 10 hit points around as well. That is the other thing. And that 10 HP is, what, just less than 10% of its total health on average. So quite irritating. Yeah, I guess I think they can be dangerous if they've got some friends. Yeah. Because... Action economy is going to mess them up otherwise. That's right. But you say about most things that don't have <laughs> lair or legendary actions. Yeah. It also gets multi-attack as well, which you'd expect to something of this challenge rating. Oh, it's got three attacks. It would go at you with its bite, and it's got two claws, or it's got two staff attacks. The reason the staff attacks are of note is that this thing also is a shape changer. And so it can use an action, or just in general life, polymorph into basically whatever the hell it wants, but a small or medium humanoid. Ideal for blending in a crowd. Mm. And that's, you know, humanoid may carry a staff. They're probably not going to be wielding um, bigger weapons than that. When they get into Grey Slard territory or Death Slard territory, they start getting the ability to actually have weapons, big swords, stuff. But that's not what we're about. We're about the Green Slard, the one who wants to become Grey. Yeah, I did think it was funny though, reading upon this, like, in the last week, that for some reason, Grey Slards teach themselves how to use a sword. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, why not? Stick it in, log sword now. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but when I've survived 400 years, I take it upon myself to think what I really need to know now is bladecraft. You know what would really go well and just make me as a creature pop in my new colour? <laughs> a long sword. Yeah. Stick it on. So, oh, I've gone grey. Well, maybe I can offset that with a swing. <laughs> the cold steel just goes nicely with the sort of tinge of horrible gruesomeness I am now. I'm not a grey slard, I'm a gunmetal slard. Is it, oh, so a grey slard's like the teenagers of, uh, of the slardy. <laughs> like, you got green, green is sort of like, they're young, they're a bit, like, you know, naive and keen. Grey is like the emo teenage years, and then death slard's like, adult, gets a job in accounting. Exactly where I was going to go with that, yeah. Just I mean, cubicle that's office job. <laughs> classic middle age doing stuff, office job, cubicle. Okay, so Jake, now we've sort of gone over the regular out of the yep. book. This is a green slard. What's your take on this green slard? Sure. Well, I've got a little scenario kind of planned out. Perhaps we spend a little time just looking at some of the key features of no, green slard psychology. That will then mm. make the bits of the scenario pop. You can see how we've woven them in. So, psychology of green slard. 
One of the places I often go to whenever I've decided to flick through the Monster Manual and come across an interesting critter is I go to the internet because I'm a child of the 90s and that's what we do. One of my favourite websites for this sort of thing is um, it's called themonstersknow.com. And what it is, is like, the monsters know what they're doing. This is a mm. website that started off as a blog, I think, and it was put together with the idea that instead of trying to run monsters as bags of hit points that attack things, they were trying to pick a monster, um, monster of the day, monster of the week or whatever, and looking at its stat blocks and spell lists if appropriate and alignments and so forth, try and put a degree of personality on there. Mm -hmm. Because they're not all stupid. When you've got like a high intelligence creature, which you know, the green slot, reasonably intelligent, it's 11, it's slightly more than 10. Not as much as the grey slard mm -hmm. with its mighty 13, but it, you know, the whole point is that it's not a complete, bumbling, animalistic fool. Yeah. So it's got motivations, it's got goals, it's got stuff. Versus a wolf. A wolf is like, I am an animal, I want to kill so I can eat. Yeah, acts on instinct. Exactly. So I love this website. It's excellent for trying to just give you some motivation ways to play things so you're not just like taking all the spell casters that you've thrown against your party and running them forward as if they're melee characters it just puts in your mind okay let's <laughs> let's actually think about what would they do so let's think about what would a slard do it's a sentient spell caster and its primary goal is to become a grey slard it wants to metamorphosize into it so they are mm -hmm. generally going to try and stay under cover under wraps under stealth that's how i want to play this in my scenario in your mind, what does this green slard need to do to become a grey slard? Live for 400 years. Oh, it's a time thing? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So basically all you have to do is exist and exist. not get in too much trouble. Yeah. But they are driven by a some degree of instinct, being of the, the element of chaos. They have to mess with the world and do things and cause yes. problems and so they're, they're constantly this little dichotomy of I have to be a thorn in the side of everything and just ruin stuff and also mm -hmm. survive long enough to become grey okay gotcha Okay, so that's sort of where I'm, I'm sitting with my, my green slard, it's, it's stuck between that slightly animalistic chaotic core but with enough sentience to know that it wants to live, survive, become grey, because that's the only way for it to really progress. <laughs> you know? That's the promotion it wants. Exactly, yeah. It wants the badge of grey. <laughs> it wants the office cubicle. No, he doesn't want the cubicle anymore. He wants the bloody corner office. Yeah. Well, the, the grey slot, this is the one where they want like access oh, to sorry. CDs with parental advisory stickers on and hoodies. Yeah, I'm thinking a step ahead. <laughs> take it back. So, yeah. Okay. So it's, yeah. Gotcha. That's their, their core thing. So, if they're on the material plane, they're going to use their um, shape change ability to blend in. That's going to keep them stealthy on the down low. They'll try and be inconspicuous humanoid forms. And in particular, one of the points we didn't talk about is how they, um, how they reproduce. We need to talk mm -hmm. birds and bees of slards. I think it's third edition they brought this in, but they can... It's basically like alien... They kind of impregnate yeah. hosts with little tadpoles and what they call it, the chaos phage, which is a much more hardcore way of saying death tadpole. Yeah, they want to find humanoids to infect and inject and grow alien tadpoles inside them. Yeah, yeah. Then that does mean, because they've got the shape-changing ability, it says in the, the book you know, that they can use an action to polymorph into a smaller medium humanoid or back into its true form, yada, yada, yada. That's very grey. Monsters know what they're doing. They're saying, well, maybe they can they can take the form or they can polymorph into the things that they've impregnated in the past. And it gives them like a, a skin memory or flesh memory or something, which I think is quite a cool Ooh. little bit in there. Mm -hmm. But like that's that. not quite enough. Because they are still slard inside, they don't speak any other language but slard. And that's mm -hmm. an inconvenience for anything that's trying to completely blend in. So they will still... Like behave weirdly, erratically, chaotically, and they won't be able to talk unless they talk in slard, which would also be weird. Yeah. I imagine slard being some like really deep, throaty, like ribbity noise. Yeah. <laughs> That's much better already. <laughs> it's the only deep voice I can do. Growly, growly. Grimity frog. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so with these motivations, this slard, he wants to get near people so he can 
infect them with his eggs. Yeah. But you can't understand. They can understand. They, they could understand any language and they can communicate mm. telepathically. Okay, but he doesn't want to give up the game by talking, so it's just a mute that acts weird in a regular society. Yeah. Yeah, that is that's how I'm I'm starting to when when I'm pulling these threads in, yes, that's what's starting to form in, in my mind. Okay, cool. Right. There's another key feature of slards that we also haven't touched on, and now is the time to do so. They have on the elemental plane of chaos or the, the chaosy plane, they have a big old stone. It's called the spawning stone, or at least it is yes. in fifth edition. It has further back origins where one of the gods tried to make the chaos plane make sense by throwing a law stone at it, but it got filled with Primus. chaos and horrible things, and it got corrupted. Anyway, that stone mm. is like a spawning ground for the Sladi, so they all come back and they do their business there. Yeah. The Sladi also have a gem in their brain. Yes. And that gem allows a degree of control over If you're able to, with you know sufficiently powerful magic, release that gem from the Sladi's brain, you can control the Slad. I think fifth edition puts that nice little spin on, which says it's a bit of the spawning stone, so that they have yes. they, ca- they carry a bit of that with them. They have to have touched the the spawning stone while they're in limbo, but they're drawn to it, so most of them in in limbo have that. Yeah, limbo. That's the word I keep forgetting. Yes, you you can magically get the stone out of their brain, but there's also you can do like a mechanical check to do it. It's like a DC twenty two check. Ooh, I haven't uh, seen this. Yeah, so on page on page two seven four of the monster manual. There's like a green box that describes it. Mm-hmm. You have to do a, a DC 20 wisdom check. Oh, I see. This is the variant. On... Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. So if you fail that, basically you're not good enough at medicine to <laughs> extract a crystal from a crazy space frog's brain. And you deal like a, a bucket full of damage to it each time you attempt that. 4d10 psychic damage. And also the slot has to be in a state where you can dig around its brain. Yeah. So, you know, it's nice that they've put that in there, but, like, how often is that going to come up? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not super common, unless you've got them on your operating table in Faraway Butcher's Clinic or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's not my scenario, but that's one for another exotic time. Exotic meat. We've gone back to exotic meats again. It's the same as the, uh, you know, it's like this cube marmalade. That's it. We're back in the roadside tavern from the number of times. Oh, gosh, we've failed to extract the gem from another green slard. <laughs> <laughs> Best make him into stew. Best make him into Caesar salad. <sighs> I'm not sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So these are these are all little bits of things that matter in the um in the monster manual and the various web guides about green slard. You know, it's got this gem in its head. It's trying to remain undercover because it kind of wants to survive long enough to become grey. It impregnates. It creates other slard by or sladdy by alien style dropping tapple babies into unsuspecting humanoids or I mm-hmm. suppose anything but humanoids are specifically called out um, and they are innately bound to limbo as you said yes quite right the, the plane of chaos the plane of limbo and as such they are chaotic critters cool so with that we can sort of wrap up the episode and everyone can go out there and play a lovely green slard they can and if they don't want to think for themselves I have a little <laughs> scenario that I think we'll have a little bit of fun bantering back and forth with. That's what I'm here for. That's what I want. Excellent. So, here's my little setup. Your party arrives in town. Doesn't matter. And mm-hmm. they're talking to someone in the bar. Again, doesn't matter. The, 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 the specifics of how this conversation comes about, entirely you know, organic. Do, do as you will. Sure. Critically, the thing is, you know, little Taffeta went missing a month ago. She's back now, but she's come over all shy and she won't speak to anyone. She's also behaving like a little devil. Ah, okay. So someone in town, and this yeah. is a child. This is a child. So little Taffeta mm. in in my setting is going to be a little dwarf girl. She's not an orphan. Nothing sad. She's just in this town. It's it's not going to be a like a massive massive city. So everyone knows each other, and it's like, oh yeah, she went missing, but she came back, and you know, maybe she was scared or scarred or whatever. Yeah. Now, what's actually happened is she's been lured away by a green slard out of town. She's been aliened. And is super dead somewhere in the woods. The slard right. is now being a shape change version of this little dwarf girl. Okay? Okay. Cool. Now, the reason that they have done this is because this slard is 395 years old. Just five years ah. from retirement. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
But at some point in the past, a well-known and great mage was able to magically succeed at the gem lifting um, check and right. has had control of this slard for the last hundred years. Now, this old mage has recently died. So newly free. And the whole town knows about it because, yeah, kind of newly free. Um, but it wants its gem back. So th this mage will have lived in a tower next to the town and everyone knows the mage. And, oh, yeah, it's a shame that the mage has died. On good terms with the mage? In general, yeah, they, they, they would have been, yeah, good terms. They would have helped the crops. They would have protected them from bandit raids sure. or just generally have been about, you know, made magical minor artifacts. Well liked, for... well liked and kept himself. Yeah, magical Viagra man. You know, supplied <laughs> the town with all sorts of... <laughs> Odds and ends that they needed. Wonderful. Okay, anyway, he dead. Don't matter. Yep. Just old age, nothing untoward. So our Slard has you know, regained their, their own control, but they want the gem back. They can't mm -hmm. get the gem because they don't know how to get it out. It's in some magical lock. You could put it in a, a, a personal portable dimension. It could be in a okay. at the end of a puzzle, the end of a maze. That at this point kind of matters not although it would be a cool little thing for your party to possibly pursue were yeah. they to figure all these little layers out. So so has the slard then, prior to abducting little Tabitha... Tab sorry, not Tabitha. Um, Taffeta. Taffeta. Like catheter, but with... Like catheter. Okay. That's an easy way to remember it. So, <laughs> so prior to abducting little catheter... I can't remember it. <laughs> I, want to, I, want, I just want to say catheter now. Little catheter. Um, it's like yeah. cath, but... Anyway... <laughs> he's gone to the mage's tower and had a look for his gem couldn't find it or found it but couldn't access it yeah and then now he's on plan b to try and get it yeah and plan b is mostly anger driven so what what they're going to do as little catheter is um <laughs> as taffeta is they are going to try and just cause cause a ruckus in town get the place to empty out so they might have some time to be able to go in the mage's tower and steal the box it's in, or steal the, the something, or you know, have some time alone with it. Basically, they've not been able to get in. They know it's in there. They can feel it. It's my brain gem. It's in that tower. I can't get in. I can't figure it out. It's just frustrating. So they are frustrated. Okay, so they're Scooby-Dooing the place so that everyone leaves. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Now, the way they're going to do that, I also went to the internet and was searching through some wonderful, wonderful sounding adventures. And I'm going to nick one because that's what the internet is for. And that's what all DMs should do. Steal everything. People should steal this. People should steal this. That's the point. <laughs> this is from a website, um, nerdarchy.com or nerdarchy, N-E-R-D-A-R-C-H-Y.com. And they have a series of out-of-the-box D&D encounters. Cool. Um, and I've taken bits and pieces of this i've just I've, all that backstory was stuff that i've added to their start point which is the slard is a child cool fine doesn't matter why what i am going to take from this is that if your players don't investigate any of the little hooks that are there so far like the child went missing do we go and talk to their parents do we go and interrogate the child and maybe figure out it's a slard or something option three is like we talked about in the roadside tavern option three is the i'm kicking you down the stairs approach this yep. is the this event is happening and it's going to unveil uh, you know, reveal itself and you kind of either have to get involved or have to run away you have to sort of react yeah if you don't take the initiative it's coming to you yeah we're, yeah. we're having this adventure this session <laughs> whether you like it or not exactly yeah so in fact i've written them down here as, as little vectors so plot hook one vector one investigate the girl because that was the conversation you had with someone in the bar the blacksmith someone in the market whatever the girl was behaving weird. Maybe you think, okay, that's enough of a hook. Let's go find the girl and find that she doesn't talk. She tries to keep away from you, or you bother her enough that she talks telepathically. And it would be a, a difficult-ish thing to discern that, oh, this, this is a creature of some sort, but you could maybe cause them to reveal themselves or irritate them to the point where they do something chaotic or trail them till they do something chaotic. And yeah, yeah. that okay. could spin itself out. Just a question then quickly on, on the tele telepathy. Yeah. Do you see telepathic communication being like words in their mind? Because given that given that it speaks slardy, it doesn't speak common. Mm. Is it otherwise communicating telepathically, like with emotions or images, or like how how do you think that could work? That's a good question. Because I always feel like if a creature can speak telepathically, but it doesn't share a language, mm. that 
it puts ideas in people's minds and it's sort of like you know you lock eyes with this creature and, and like you know you see images of something and it you know depending on what that creature is will determine what ideas they're able to convey through imagery you know okay. if it's something in the underdark they talk with you know flowing underground rivers and like avalanches being like dangerous you know like th- mm. things that are like relative but not direct is that how you would you play that out as a dm literally like that you know they, they would find the character they're talking to and would you be trying to conjure the imagery on the fly or would you give them a general sense and then give them like a, a little narrative of the, of the images or the emotions or the sense they put in their head yeah i think i'd probably go like describe the emotion they feel and then you know just associate that with something that that creature i mean i would have probably planned before the session like you know, <laughs> if it's if it's um i don't know they need help with something um then they see that that creature but injured and much younger you know or, or like request for help like sure. it's the vulnerable thing if it was a dangerous creature and it was communicating telepathically um yeah like some sort of rock slide or um explosion or you know images of other creatures in the underdark that it knows of that are dangerous you know mm. like so it's really indirect it's open to interpretation by the party but that's fine with me i don't want to just tell them he tells you this and you know that okay that's kind of the question i should have asked then yeah are you going to leave it ambiguous and you say yeah. open to interpretation you're not going to say you get the sense that they're telling you this but here's how no it's, it's more like mm. you feel saddened and a bit afraid there's a sense of unknowing, yeah. uh, and while this is, while this sort of feeling sort of washes over you, you ha- you know it conjures images of um, water breaking against rocks and yeah. uh, a bat or a scorpion or you know who knows what. Interesting. So in the case of this slard, that would require a little bit more prep than certainly mm. I've done in the last week because <laughs> what would a slard's experiences be, or would they know enough about the human world that they've lived in? in order to be able to communicate in terms they think they might understand? Is it like, you know, humans sending that gold record out on, on Voyager or whatever, and we've put on, you know, music and so on, because we think people will play the record and they'll understand, oh, this is, this is music, it's meant to sound nice, not it's a <laughs> language or something. You know, we're making assumptions of intelligence, aren't we? Hmm. Well, if it's a 395-year-old slot <laughs> that was previously enthralled by this wizard, yeah, who is a human... I'm going to guess that it's going to have some knowledge of what humans would interpret symbols as. In fact, if it's been around for like 100 years under the service of this guy, it's probably picked up some common. That's interesting. Yeah, maybe some core phrases, some core words. Like key commands. Yeah, yeah. You don't want your party completely lost and think, okay, that was a waste of time. If you can get in a couple of majorly operative words, but the rest is imagery, or it starts off as imagery, and then the longer they're, they're talking, the, the harder it tries, and yeah. it gets a couple of words in. I think that's that's fair. You could do that. Could work, couldn't it? Anyway, uh, I meant to ask you, like, how do you want to do it? <laughs> no, that's cool. This is, this is the bits that I like to talk with you about, the ones where I've, I've had a thought, but what's not complete? Or yeah, what else would you need to know? Anyway, that's vector, vector one. Investigate the girl. Number two could be investigate the disappearance. They could try and pick up the trail, find out where the girl went, where they were that day, their movements. You could have a whole little investigation arc, leads them off into the woods. Maybe they find the corpse. That would be quite convenient. It'll be a month old, but they could medicine check it, see there's something growing in there. It could burst out. It could be a little slidey tadpole. They have a reasonably short gestation period, and they're not terribly dangerous when they're in tadpole form. Challenge rating one-eighth. Yeah. (laughs) So that could offer a a pretty hefty clue to the nature of what's happened to the actual girl, and that would get them in and say, you are a slard. And it goes, alas, I have been undone, and become (laughs) become actual slard and start doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Vector three, which is my kicking them down the stairs one, I've called Marketplace Chaos. I love it. And that's where I've taken some pretty liberal inspiration from this um, Nerdarchy website and their plan. What they said is, give your slard a bag of beans which is a wonderful little magic item which yeah. comes with a, um, a random effect table. So anyone that wants to have a look at this, it's on page 153, or the end of 153, well, the end of 152 to 153 in your Dungeon Master's Guide. And yeah, bag of beans, wondrous item, rare. I'm going to give my creature seven beans. It says give them 3d4. They're having seven because I don't want there to be too many things out of my control. This is kind of going to be almost run initiative style when it starts happening. 
Mm-hmm. So they'll get they'll get the first one for free, as it were, and then it will be a case of initiativo. So things that you could get in this bag, you could sprout a tree ant. You know, that's annoying. That's a big deal. That's a big old deal. Um, a statue could p- turn up. A campfire with blue flames turns up. You could get a regular tree. A pyramid might turn up. Um, I think there are other animals as well. Okay. So it's doing this again to scare the local population. Yes. But at this point, because it's so frustrated, it kind of doesn't mind what happens. So it's, I want to clear this town out. I'm no longer worried about their death being a consequence in particular. So it's, okay. what it's going to do, it's, it, it's gone. It's gone to the marketplace. The marketplace is crowded because it is a town where this sort of thing happens. So we're going to have a good number of people in there, you know, 100-ish. Let's just consider that it's full. It's a busy marketplace. It's like um, you know, Christmas market level of busy. Yep. So much so that you could consider it difficult to rain. You can't just like bolt on through. You've got to shove people out the way and wriggle on through. I was going to ask, how do you plan on running 100 NPCs in such a space? Not at all. I'm just going to plan on running <laughs> them as a pang of the conscience for the party. A bit of collateral damage perspective. Because you, you know, all of a sudden you've got an encounter. You're fighting this creature you're fighting the slard you're fighting the slard looks like a child mm-hmm. let's just nuke it with fireball yeah of course you could do that uh, but now mm-hmm. what you're going to do is you're going to also murder to death 10 civilians which isn't going to bother that many people but you know well, your party <laughs> might be a bit more conscientious <laughs> one might hope that they would yeah. consider their actions or even like firing a longbow into the crowd let's say just because you happen to have 60 foot worth of range on your spell or on your bow doesn't mean it's appropriate to do that into a throng of people unless you can get the high ground or something like that. Yeah. What I'm trying to do is stop it from just being a, a nuke fest, and that kind of plays back against the action economy problem. Yeah, I like the added difficulty in fighting it, but just sort of like picture how it starts then. So the party just enter the town square and the first beam goes off, whatever it is. Yes. Did they identify, is the slard now, has it revealed itself? No. What the slide is, the slide is still in child form, and what they're doing is they've got their bag of beans. A bean from a bag of beans will take a minute to, to germinate, a little gestation period, or activate, basically do its thing. Because that would be a pain in the butt, once we go into initiative mode, that would be ten all rounds. What I'm going to say here is that it will be five rounds. They, they are shoving the bean in their face, and you know, there's an opportunity for your party to see this happen if they are close enough to the character doing it. And I think we might even make it a set piece, so they see she like shoves it in her mouth, and what's actually happening, her chaotic saliva is accelerating the growth of the bean. Okay, so the party arrives at the marketplace, Yep. and they see the little girl... And she's shoving beans in her mouth. And no, there's nothing untoward happening at the moment. It's just a busy marketplace. And it's just a busy marketplace. And what she does is sticks it in the ground. So they'll plant the first bean in the ground, basically at the point where the PCs make eye contact. Or what we'll say, you know, there'll be a, a sort of relatively easy to pass check of perception mm-hmm. or something. Or maybe there'll just be an event where it knocks into or someone, oh, Taffeta, I haven't seen you in ages, and nothing. Oh, yeah. cool, that's the person we're looking for. Fine. PCs now, the party see Taffeta. And yeah. in that moment, that's when the first bean comes from the mouth and goes into a bit of soil. Gotcha, I follow now. And then... A few seconds later, bam, we roll the dice, see what happens. A beanstalk okay. sprouts up and it upturns carts and sends some people flying. And Okay, and then it's roll initiative because we're assuming then the, the party's going to want to fight this little girl. Yes. Okay, because yes. they might they might at this point not know yet that she's a slard in disguise. That's the thing. They just know that she's done something weird. Yeah. My first thought then is that this girl has some kind of incredibly dangerous magic item and doesn't know what she's doing. Mm-hmm. So, like, I, I wouldn't think to attack her first off. I'd be, like, bustling through the crowd to try and get it off her before she does more harm than she knows. But I guess you could still do that in initiative order. I think you could, yeah. So... I'm sort of toying with this back and forth, this whole initiative thing, because as soon as you say those magical words, I need you to roll initiative, people go into combat mode in their brains. Okay, yeah. Whereas what we're actually doing in this instance is kind of like your trap the other week. We're treating it as making sure everything gets its proper place in the turn and it's no longer just a mad dash or scramble for actions. Okay. Well, we could, you, could, you could always frame it like that. Yeah, but that might not be fully appropriate. So the other thing we could do is, as a DM, if you don't want to give the game away... What should probably happen is 
girl puts Bean in ground, thing happens, and she visibly dashes into the crowd. So you've okay. got an event that's occurred, you've got an escaping character. That should be enough of a breadcrumb for your party to say, I follow or I chase. Mm -hmm. If they do or don't, that's fine. But let's assume that they do. If they do, they're going to have to try and fight their way through the crowd. Mm -hmm. Now, the creature in this moment, the slard, the child, is in full-on making chaos happen mode. So they are going to dash in a random direction generated by dice. They'll be taking that dash action to try and put extra distance away from a regular movement on difficult terrain. And mm -hmm. then wherever possible, they will use um, dash for a turn in a direction. They'll use an action to plant and then repeat that cycle until they've run out of beans. So there could be seven things going on if your party don't catch up with them appropriately. And I guess if the party doesn't chase after her and just sort of mill around or start leaving or anything, then yeah. you just describe what next crazy thing happens. Yeah. Okay. And so at some point, either they themselves get affected by it, by the something, or maybe we choose something that's a little bit more dangerous. So a lot of the bag of beans things are, okay, yeah, Triant is quite a big deal. There's a fifty percent mm. chance that that particular triant is chaotic evil and just starts attacking things, mm. which is something that you have to get involved in. Yeah, as, as, a, as a you know regular adventuring party, of course, you don't turn up a chance for fight something and get some XP. Yeah, absolutely. This is going to make people try and scatter. The more things that go off, the fewer people there will be around. But because it's such a chaotic moment and the stuff going on in all parts of the marketplace, we can assume that there is going to be a general milling of people, and therefore mm -hmm. AOE spells still might not be fully appropriate or there's, there's that opportunity for collateral damage that your party might just hesitate at as they try yeah. other ways to try and stop this girl and find out exactly what's going on yeah i mean if each initiative round is six seconds that's yeah. not a lot of time to start fleeing if you're in a crowd no i do really like the idea that there's you know this thing stopping you from acting it's not you know you're in a regular sort of battle environment where you can do anything you've got to think yeah. about what's going on you know this is when a natural one is really going to have consequence. You know, this would actually be a really good opportunity for some creative use of skills. So maybe your rogue says, I want to move through there and I want to take the, the dash action and make all this distance. Or if they're just that close to making a, a place they want to get to, give them that opportunity to make a, an acrobatics check or an athletics check to see if they can maybe combat the effects of the crowd. I don't know. I don't want to completely... root. I like the fact that the crowd is there as difficult terrain to mm -hmm. start with, or at least emulating difficult terrain. But if it comes a point where your party are not making progress because they're constantly getting battered around by this, what I would probably do over a couple of combat rounds is thin the crowd or give them the opportunity whenever they make the move to use an appropriate skill check to better navigate their way through. You know, okay. so the, the rogue yeah. uses decks and they are able to sort of slip through the crowd shifty style or the, the the barbarian just puts a shield up or something and just barrels through a few people <laughs> knocking them over but you know they've used an athletics or a strength to juggernaut their way through a little bit create a bit of a path yeah. so the rest of the party can come through or people can do some creative things like that and if they are not yeah you know, if the party don't try and offer some of these up within the first couple of rounds maybe i'd drop the idea sure that makes sense here's another idea then for that Mm. If this is such a crowded marketplace, maybe we give it a reason for being so crowded. Like, it's an event, or it's like yeah. a festival of some sort. And the market stalls would could be traversable. So yeah, if you describe yeah, yeah. the stalls as like, you know... And I'm, and I'm picturing sort of like a German Christmas market style thing. That's like exactly what's huts. in my mind, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, you said, German, you said uh, that sort of level of busy, so that's what, I'm, yeah. that's what I'm thinking. But imagine if you've got those sort of huts, you know, and it's difficult to move through the people's difficult terrain, but say you could get on top of one, you could easily run across them because they're just rowed up. Or yeah, jump perfect from one for to the a next. monk or something. Yeah, or back to, to your rogue, you know, like they could also like scale it quite easily and then, you know, make yeah. their way through the crowd or even just have the advantageous position to look around and try and identify it more easily. Yeah. One step further than that, just because I know someone would do it, imagine like a maypole in the middle mm -hmm. with all these long, str like, um, like bunting, like trailing yeah, off yeah, onto yeah, the yeah. tops of all the, uh, the little stalls. You could, you know, grab one of those and swing over the crowd. That would be excellent, yeah. I would, l I would love to try and set that up as like, you know, try and, try and think of a way of describing it that someone thinks like, it's my idea, I want to do this. 
rather than yeah. saying you could swing from that. Yeah, you'd almost want to have like quite a nicely detailed battle map for yes. that sort of thing. Especially if you're doing it online, that's not it's not too difficult if you've got access to you know, Incarnate or or similar. You can put some mm-hmm. bits in there that make it obvious. Or there's a um there's a sheet that I often share, and I think it was published. It was a D and D Beyond article about um, dirty tricks and other ways of traversing landscape on the battlefield. It's like sliding under tables oh, and yeah. attributing mm-hmm. roles to them, and you know, throwing pocket sand in people's faces. And one of them is a, a chandelier swing. So it's mm-hmm. only appropriate when there is something there. But maybe before this session, I would repost that and say, "No, <laughs> don't forget about all this cool combat trick stuff." Yeah. No, oh, yeah, I remember that. It was exactly the mechanic for like chandelier swinging that I was imagining. Yeah, and it's fine if someone has the idea. It's it's easy enough to do. You work out how far it might swing. You stick a, a check on there to make sure they don't lose their grip or something, and you go away. But someone, uh, I'm sure it was D and D Beyond. Someone that there has you know, thought about it and balanced it to some degree. So there is a mm. you know you can fail at it, and here's what happens, and here's how much it hurts, sort of thing. Well, why don't we just say that these sort of maple type things are sort of dotted around? There's like a yeah, group of them. There's yeah. not one in the middle. Because I was just thinking, like, how long is this bunting going to be? He's going to swing for a second and drag on the floor. But if there's a, if there's a few of them and they're just decorative, then you could swing from them. It's maybe a DC 10 dex check just to make sure that you, you yeah. know, do it right. Because, like, what I, what I would hate is if someone tried it and just, like, fell instantly. Like, it was yeah. too difficult. I think I'd only put a complete failure, like you lose your grip or you slip and fall i'd stick that on a one anything mm. below 10 sure i would probably in fact this is probably a good little exercise in arbitrarily setting dcs for things generally you want it to be cool whatever's happening if it's cool it has a reasonably low dc in my mind because if someone's put some creativity of thought into it i want it to succeed as much as they do mm-hmm. but you can't just win everything because otherwise that's no that, fun that, exactly it tells the wrong story if you want to succeed you want them to feel like they've 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 done it because it was like it was cool, but it wasn't just like anyone could do this. They've yeah. done it. So I would do that. I'd say that in my head. Yeah, natural one. It's going to go wrong. You're going to fall off. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not super into critical fails of things, but especially if they're swinging at a certain height, there's fall damage to think about, and maybe a an athletics check to check the land or acrobatics. You know, do you stick the landing or do you really hurt yourself? The you opportunity to save yourself some damage. Or they kick the a peasant in the head. To kick someone in the head, yeah, crumple yeah, somebody. Bumpins, they they completely misjudge like how high they need to hold up the road to just swing straight into the crowd. <laughs> Judge the jungle <laughs> style. Yeah. <laughs> just straight to the ground. <laughs> so yeah, th- then in my head I'd have ten as like the, the general success point. If they get over a ten, cool, they they make the swing and if they get uh, I don't know, seventeen and up, then we'll put a little bit of flair on in the description for how cool it looks when they do it. You can even say that they, you know, the, the momentum from the swing carries them so effortlessly that they get five feet of movement once they're on, once they're on sure. the next row of uh, German Christmas market huts. That's it. And then that's actually a good point. Yeah, if they, if they super succeed. So if they get 10 to 17, they make it to the other side and it costs them a skill check, which is probably a bit of action. Or you could say it takes up your whole movement to do this thing because maybe it's a bit further. You know, maybe they've got 40 foot worth of swing. They get a little bit extra out of it. But that's it. You've got nothing else. Mm-hmm. If it's below a 10, maybe they, they swing out and it's not quite enough. There needs to be some sort of non-damaging penalty to that. Well, that's that's what I was thinking. So if they're swinging, they need to end up somewhere. Whereas if yes. they don't get all the way or don't like stick the landing, they just swing back. And eventually they're going to like, well, I don't know. Would you, you couldn't have them just like spending turns swinging back and forth. So no, I'd probably play it out as they swing, they don't make the landing they want. And so, you know, they sort of come to a stop at the bottom of the pole instead. Okay. So they're back on the floor, back in the crowd. Okay. Yeah, fair dues. I was thinking about it a slightly different way would be to... And they're both completely valid. I think the other one would be let them swing across, but they have to make a check on landing because they haven't quite got the momentum to carry them on there. And so they're still holding on to the rope, but their feet have touched down and it's a... Yeah, your classics. It's an ath- athletics or acrobatics to can you not fall off the edge? Yep, that's much better. So, so they they definitely make it either way, but they have to the yep. check to do it. And if they fail, they're prone, which is you know going to cost a movement next turn. Yeah, exactly. So there's a bit of a minor penalty in there, but they still succeeded the cool thing. I like that a lot. Okay, so we've sort of set the scene a little bit then with what's going on. 
it's or yes. how it looks at least. But yeah. what, what are we seeing? What I mean, you could even have this as flavor when the party first arrive in town. There's sort of like a bustle going on. Everyone's in good spirits. The only thing that's maybe a bit rubbish recently is the fact that this kid disappeared. But even they turned up again. Huzzah! That's good. Yeah, I like I like the idea of it being a festival. As you say, it's a good reason for the place to be crowded. It's a good reason to put some Christmas music on in the background. It's a good reason for the party to go into the market if they don't want to follow the story. Yes, yeah. It's a good little deviation, that. What could we have the festival being? Is it a wintry one? Is it just fantasy German Christmas? That is certainly one option. I think my my core thoughts are Christmassy, wintry festival, um, harvesty festival, or midsummery festival. Okay. So it doesn't really matter. You can you can have it in any any party. You just choose whichever season you're in. That's the thing they're doing. It's yeah. not really very specific. There's no real traditions except huts and bunting. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is, for the purposes of this description, we're going to say it's um, a springtime and it's a celebration that the winter is over because this is a harsh winter in this part mm-hmm. of the world. And when it's over, everyone's very happy. Mostly because you said Maypole, but also because it's making me think Charter Day back in our hometown. <laughs> is there going to be a duck race? Yeah, there'll be a duck race. <laughs> <laughs> Rubber ducks in the river. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, but also because you know it's past Christmas time and it, it largely, as you say, it doesn't really matter. Choose a festival of your choice. I'm going to choose springtime, May Day, May Poly, eventy thing. So I've gone for the mm-hmm. spring festival. And that's my setting reason is because this is maybe a slightly uh, northern-ish town or... F- there's a reason that the winters are harsh here. It's up in the mountains or something. So mm-hmm. the fact that they've made it through another winter and almost everyone's alive, top banana, let's have a party. Yeah. Set the wizard. Yeah, said the wizard who did that. <laughs> <laughs> but we get out the, like, the last of the salted meats that were meant to bring us through the winter and they're mm-hmm. all on little um, hog roasty barbecue spits turning away. And so Ooh, it's... There's, there's your natural one swinging on a, on a maple. <laughs> You land in the barbecue pit. You go into the hog. <laughs> you go prone and an apple lands in your mouth. <laughs> okay, cool. So we've sort of set the scene of it then. And yeah. sort of fleshed it out and we can yeah, got a way of sort of rolling it out into, into different times of year if necessary. Yes. The slard is going about. They're planting their beans while disguised as a little girl. Yep. Um at what point is the slard revealing themselves? Because I still don't feel like... I mean, I, I, I mean maybe I've just, like... Because I've taken it wrong to start with. Like, I don't mm-hmm. feel like this is combat. I feel like, this, in this scenario, we need to get this dangerous magic item away from this girl that doesn't know what she's doing because she's out yeah. of sorts, you know? Well, I think we have a way around that. So, the slard has its plan. It's done a really good job surviving 395 years, although the last 100 were due to a degree of servitude under the... Um, the dearly departed mage, mm-hmm. it wants to live. And slards are not happy when they're cornered, in general. They they want to flee where possible, but they will fight if cornered. So let's say that our party have somehow dealt with the market and they've, they've tracked down the little dwarven girl and they've kind of got her cornered or spotted or something. They, mm-hmm. the, the slard on their turn at that point will start acting offensively. And also because they're chaotic and don't really give a damn about the, the populace, They've got no problem hurling um, fireballs around there, and that's in their spell list, or casting fear and having apply to a bunch of places. They've also got their hurl flame attack. That's got a, an opportunity to miss, but what I would say, it, because this place is so crowded, even if they try and attack one of your party with it and it misses, it's going to set someone else on fire. Like it, It's all very chaotic, and they're just chucking spells off. What they want yeah. to do is distract you, cast invisibility, and run away. But if you've got them cornered, they're going to start chucking the big guns out. So just thinking about spells that has at his disposal and the fact it's trying to cause distraction, I mean, fireball, so it's going to mess so many people up. That's, that's massive in a crowded area. Yes. Which is going to cause people, make them flee. But equally, just casting fear on those simple-minded, you know, village plebs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are going to start running. If there's that many people, like, how, would, how could we do the stampede? Because if, if the party, maybe like, you know, say the party's like identified okay. and cornered to some extent, but there's still like people between them and the slard, or, the, you know, whatever reason the slard has cast fear earlier and tried to yeah. away. How are we running 
the stampede effect of the people like just barreling past them. We could run it in the same way that you have swimming mechanics. Okay. Couldn't we? Okay. If you really wanted to go out the book and you're thinking, oh no, is, is there a stampede? Good question. What's it like? You're battling against a torrent or, or a, a constant force in one direction. So mm-hmm. pretty sure the Dungeon Master's Guide has mechanics for that. Why, have you got something in mind? No, no, I just, I just thought of it off the cuff. Yeah, yeah. Cause, uh, but when you say swimming mechanics, it just makes you think of the Battle of the Bastards in uh, Game of Thrones, where at the end, when they're getting like, sort of kettled in, and Jon Snow's being like, crushed by all his, his, his allies... But you're thinking more of, of oh, the, the yes, kind yes, of yes. traversing through them, where I'm thinking of like holding your breath. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so when you're saying stampede, are you thinking that the, the party being smothered or like crushed by people? We're talking like Mufasa level stampede here. Well, yeah. So I mean, I mean, that makes it sound so grand, but it's basically like <laughs> you know, if we've said there are about a hundred people here, if you've got in a, you know in a small space between these these little huts, like, selling their bits of meat and whatever. Yeah. Like, if they're barreling away, like, yeah, I, I think, I mean, it's horrible to watch, but, like, you see videos of, of big crowds sort of, like, crushing against each other and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Could be a big deal, even for a, for a party of adventurers. I guess because they are trying to flee the crowd, and there would be many ways in and out of my marketplace, it wouldn't just be, like, a, a bum rush for the one exit and a big funneling effect, so I'm not... Th- okay. Just, I'm not... St- well, I'm certainly not in my setting going to generate an opportunity for that funnel to be a damaging moment. I might okay. make it more difficult terrain, or I might try and introduce that swimming mechanic, because if in one corner a seed goes off and a hungry bullet appears, mm. it's angry, it's hungry, it's trying to eat stuff, people are all going to run away from that. And so you've got yes. a general movement in one direction. That's somewhat different from this place is really crowded and you have to push your way through. All of a sudden, okay. you are opposing a, as I say, like a force in one direction. Could we have it maybe, maybe as, and thinking again back to sort of like having actions happen on certain certain initiative counters. Could we have like an initiative X event where you have to make a strength or dexterity check or be knocked prone as someone sort mm. of bustles past you, and then it's not like a, a big wave of people, but it's like. These scattered people sort of dashing around, and one just bumps into you and knocks you off your feet. Yeah, okay. So you've got like a lair action, as it were, for the marketplace. And That's depending on the number of people in your party, let's say there are six people, you roll a d6, and whoever it is in your initiative order, you, you number them all in your DM's head, one mm-hmm. to six, and whoever it is gets bustled that turn. And if it goes badly, you know, they, they get to make a save, and if they fail, they get knocked prone. Yeah, like that. Cool. So there's no damage, but there's just a movement penalty and a pain in the butt because they've now got to get up and they yeah. might lose concentration if they have it, that sort of thing. Well, I think it's interesting this, this encounter so far I've described it because you know they're searching for this person and they need to sort of cover ground to see through the crowds. Yeah. Um, and a lot of what we've talked about in terms of mobility have been like how we're impeding them. So like difficult terrain, yes. the mechanics for swinging from the top, you know, if they're having to like jump from hut to hut, if there are these gaps so people can sort of escape in different routes. Yeah, but that's not going to be a straightforward jump each time, I guess. Um, yeah, so having having them, you know, being knocked down now and again, this is going to be like a really frustrating little hide and seek for the party. Yeah, you know, what? I like that for the same reason we touched on before. It puts the action economy back in balance. So there's only one foe, really, unless you know there's a random chance that some other um, combative foe turns up mm. as a result of the beans. A bean generally warrior. speaking, a bean warrior. <laughs> yeah. In general, we want just to get the slard. And if your party of six all surround it and start hitting it with their best attacks, it's not going to last long. 120 odd hit points. Yeah. It's not going you know, it's going to be that normal three rounds of combat, whatever. This will extend it artificially by, as you say, impeding the party. Perfect. Yeah. yeah because they can't all necessarily have a go on their turn. No. Like they might not be able to see, they might not have an action that works given how crowded it is around. Yeah, the little girl at that point, and this also like plays into the regeneration of the slard. So if they can sort of yeah, get away yeah, for yeah. a turn, and there's enough sort of impeding, or like a monster appears and distracts the party for a turn or two, yeah, that's going to give it time to sort of heal itself again. So what I would think with this, then, often in a combat, you know, you get to that point where it's gone on too long, and that's usually because every turn is same. Okay, I'm going to move, and then I'm going to look down my spell list because I should definitely have looked at this 
before, but I didn't. And I'm going to choose that spell. <laughs> and what does that spell do? Tell me that again. Oh, it does this. Cool. Roll damage. Is there a save on that? Yeah, okay. Let's see. Do they save? Oh, yes, they do. Or no, they don't. Let's narrate the bit that happens and move on to the next person's turn. Mm-hmm. Most of this is going to be admin of people trying to get in range to do the thing they want to do. So I think yeah. the turns will go a little quicker. And you're right, it will be frustrating. So I think I might try and choose another little way to at least put a mechanic in place for frustrating people. So we already said before, our spellcasters are going to be irritated because this thing is resistant to most elements. Mm -hmm. Even if they could get a spell off that targeted a single foe and they're in a crowded place. There's a risk. We might make, yeah, there's a risk. So we'll make, well, they'd be rolling to hit them anyway. There might be a disadvantage or maybe we'd say the slard constantly has half cover, three quarters cover or something because of all the people in the way. Makes unless, sense. Unless you're able to get some high ground. We could also, in a pinch, um, put perception checks in the way. So I want to do this spell, and I haven't seen them in a turn or two, but I know they went that way. And you think, okay, well, unless it's like magic missile or something, it's definitely going to find its mark. You need to make sure you can see the target before I'm going to let you roll for it. Okay, so how about then we have every time the slot is able to like duck around the corner or something, like break line of sight with the party. Yeah, they have to they have to rediscover her. Like, and that's a, that's a group thing they have to do like rather than individual uh, okay like, so it's almost so, like a layer action uh, do you perceive them this round yeah exactly so like they disappear around the corner and then you know you the dm know where they are where they've yep. moved to and then the party have to sort of fan out look for clues and then they do mm-hmm. a group perception check which you take the average from you know and again set the dc quite low yeah. but it's just sort of like to encourage them to know like rather than them all just head in one direction together they can like sort of try and guess mm. where the slard's at that's quite good because it spreads out the party, which is good and bad, depending it, on the, the enemies on the field. It encourages them to maybe get to a higher location for advantage to try yes. and, you know, some of the other movement options we've talked about. Um, yeah, so let's put some higher buildings at like the, the outskirts of the market square. So there's like, I'm thinking Redford again, but look, there's the town hall and you could maybe get, you could get on top of some of the huts or the markety stally mm-hmm. things, but that only gets you, you know, seven, eight feet in the air. Not a massive vantage point, but if you wanted to spend a turn climbing the town hall or spend a turn climbing a very large pole for a vantage point mm-hmm. then yes you can do that and we'll, we'll remove all the cover bonuses so if you put your ranger in the clock tower they're just like sniper's paradise aren't they well it's, it's even more difficult then for the for the slant to break line of sight because yes you know unless they're behind a building you know or behind a hut it's like well they can't go left or right here because i would see them so they must be there exactly still. yeah that's quite cool and other thing <laughs> i think i would definitely do now we've discussed it to this point when I said they were the the, the dwarf girl, they mm. will be distinctive. So maybe this is a, a reasonably beige looking town, but this child, this dwarf child, is like she's she's her beard's coming through and she's very blonde, <laughs> but she has like Helga style pigtails, so she's almost like she belongs in the Swiss Alps and here she is in Northern England mining town, sort That's of so much better than what I thought. <laughs> when you said it's like a beige town, I just imagined the girl in the red jacket from Schindler's List. Oh, uh, okay. I mean, that's that, anything would do, but just something that makes it, oh, we've definitely found the one, not one of her many <laughs> siblings. Or yeah, This yeah. could be anyone, I think. it's the, like it, When you see her, you see her. It's the right they one. grab her and turn her around, and it's like, it's not even a dwarf. It's, <laughs> you know, it's a goblin with like a massive nose. <laughs> oh, beg your pardon, miss. Miss? <laughs> I was hanging my coat on that hay bale. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've sort of thought about now how this session is going to go and what's like sort of the main focal point of the adventure in, in the, the market square. Yeah. What happens then? So, well, I guess we do it in a couple of ways. So either the slant gets cornered at some point by the party mm-hmm. or surrounded or, or like restricted its movement in some way. And at that yeah. point, it it's casting magic or revealing itself as evil yes i think as soon as it casts magic it's going to fall out of oh it's polymorph isn't it it's shape-shifting so it could stay Mm. in character if it wanted to but it might not want to if it wants to use its bite attack for example it's got to drop form so let's say combat wise it's become big green comb the frog of doom yeah so to avoid to avoid then getting into a scenario where they've cornered the girl and they still think for whatever reason she's just a little girl that's acting out yeah. Do we just have the big reveal of like, oh, actually, I'm a slard? I think that's an easy way through. Yes, we should definitely do that. Okay. It's just as soon as it goes into combat mode, we reveal 
Yeah, Death Kermit. Cool. And then, yeah, big reveal. Not actually the girl. And then you can do the regular combat. Is, is it still trying to escape at this point, or is it fighting to the death? It wants to escape. Okay. In general. So it will be going for some of the... Co- but it will also, when it gets to towards the edges of the map or something, maybe it also has to fight against the crowd and it's not easy to escape. So I'm not going to make it so it just casts invisibility and does one and you can't see it because what I want the party to do is feel a degree of success. Yeah, that's not rewarding. If they get distracted, like maybe four beans in a row are tree ants and they're all angry. And then mm. there's a couple of hungry bullets that come in. And basically, if, if there's a bigger distraction on that the party's focused on, then the girl will escape. And then they can set off down another little side quest of our own making, which is track her down. We know what she looks like. We know where she's going as well. The wizard sour. Well, we know that, but the party don't necessarily know that. Ah, yeah. How do we make that clear? You could have any number of NPCs say they saw the, the, the frog creature leave town in that direction. And that headed yeah, towards was, the wizard's tower. It could also go back to its you know, lair where it killed the girl. So that, fu- also, that funnels you back down the route of discover the child, discover the yes, baby slards. That's also then fun. someone could maybe do some reading and figure out what this animal is. And some, Do I recognize it? Oh yeah, you know, it's a slard. And then outside a session, we'd probably have a little conversation about what they do and don't know about it. Yeah, that works really well. So yeah, so and then regardless of where the party goes, they will find the slard there. Yeah. In fact, let's double down on that. They come back, they've discovered the thing and they've found out that there's a weird tadpole of death and they come back to the town and say, fuck, that child was a, 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 an animal that we don't understand. Are there any resources nearby? Where can we learn about it? And they say, well, we're just a simple town, but the wizard's tower over yonder... Ah, he yeah. knows about all kinds of magical threats. No wonder we're attacked by this creature now that he's gone. Yeah, he's super dead. That's a real shame, but you can go read his books. I'm sure he won't mind. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few ways to play it out. And yeah, we can do it out in, in diaries or in books, or they could just discover the box on the desk of the wizard. And it's like, oh, this is an exciting box. What's in here? Ah, a crystal. Yeah. It opens when anyone that's not a slard tries to open it. <laughs> what a crap. De- I love that. What a shit defense. <laughs> well, then there's, there's no faffing around. There's nothing. Well, actually, is that good then? Because then the party controls this slard. But they don't necessarily know that. So this is also a thing. If if the party completely ignored the marketplace event, and I don't know how they could, but hmm. or maybe if I've I've over described the town, so there's a wizard's tower over yonder, and they they somehow go there first. Mm-hmm. That there's not an easy way to bring them back into town. They could also discover this same box, and if they get open the same box, pocket dimension mm. way of hiding something magically, then they are rewarded with this odd red gem. Mm. But they don't necessarily know what it is. So once they find out what it is, they either go into town and these things happen. Um, and you could have a bit of fun. So whoever's holding the, the shard feels a reverberation or they feel like a disturbance in the force when they're near the slard or something like that. And they, I don't know, or maybe they, they feel like they can read its thoughts. Or yeah. It doesn't matter. I don't think this is a likely path. It's not what I'm going to plan out too far. But just having that in the back of my mind, especially if they went to the tower first, that gives me a new session to prep. And I would try and work that in. What happens if the slard can't escape and the party manage to kill it? Well, then they have a dead slard. What does the slard have on its person when they look in its pockets? <laughs> it's it's fro- slimy, it's moist, horrible pockets. wet, oh my cold, God. froggy, amphibious. Like, they're not pockets. They're like extra gills on its waist or something. No gills. <laughs> Frogs don't have gills. What am I about? It's just full. I mean, I've seen some images of them. They, they, they carry staffs. They have an understanding of pockets. Yeah. Uh, or satchels or stuff. Or maybe the little girl carried a bag and the slard still has the bag. <laughs> it's like a pink rucksack, but on the slard it turns into like a little like a little hip bag, like a funny bag. Yeah, but it's, it's Dora the Explorer by day and then <laughs> this horrible death frog by night. <laughs> In its pockets, um, they get the bag of beans. So however many beans are left, they get the remainder of the bag of beans. That's a Risky. fun silly chaotic little item to give a party it's not quite as bad as a deck of many things but it's a good opportunity for them to ruin some stuff that's what i was going to compare it to i feel like the bag of beans is like a discount deck of many things yeah yeah Hmm. so i think that would be kind of fun um give them it wouldn't be carrying money because it doesn't have any value of money but it would be a couple of jewelry items bracelets bangles that sort of thing that have some value 
I wasn't going to give it much else outside that. Because it's an innate spellcaster, it doesn't like need magical components or do these other things. So it, it's got no reason to have an awful lot of stuff. You know? Give it a couple of uh, red gemstones. Oh, yeah? Maybe, maybe it's, you know, in, in looking for its own head crystal, it's found <laughs> a few other bits and kept on its person. Oh, that's nice. A couple of tiny rubies. Yeah, that might help explain to the party why it was, you know, giving them images of a crystal or, you know... Because, like, yeah. at no point do you, does anyone sort of reveal, unless you got it in the notes of the wizard, that um, that this, that's what the Slard wants. Yeah. Unknown energies. Crystals. Ooh. 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 <laughs> Take it to your local hippie shop. <sighs> you just think about Redford again. Yep, yep. We've gone to Mystique, <laughs> and we've got a replica Slard crystal from... A replica Slard Mystique. crystal. Oh. <laughs> Not even, like, even a real Slard crystal. Oh, oh, I'm just thinking now, like how, like a discount, like a knockoff magic item seller. It's got like not actual magic items, but fake things of actually interesting things. Oh, so not even things that people think do stuff, but actual knockoffs of things that do stuff. Yeah, so like he has some crystals, and he's selling them as Slard mind control crystals. The Slard, we don't know where they are, you know, but if you find it, you can control it. And actually, it's yeah, just yeah, a yeah. regular glass rock. That's proper snake oil stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Mr. Snake Oil has got a stand at the festival. And there's a, a litany of red gems across it. That's where they first see the girl? Yeah, 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 yeah. And Mr. Snake Oil was... Basically, he's in town. He, prior to the wizard's death, spent time with him to try and find out stuff about the world of the arcane so that he could find something to basically just like sell to people. Ah, your springtime festival's coming up soon. What can I sell to these poor mooks? <laughs> I've got these blank spell scrolls. <laughs> just just add spells. <laughs> um, but yeah. Ooh. I, I don't, tell me how you feel about this, but this guy, having sort of like schmoozed up with the wizard and tried to learn something that he could basically make a profit off quick, hmm. found out about the green slard and the control crystal and knows about that as a thing that exists and can be the NPC that puts two and two together later on after the fact if you want to give the party like here's your information dump you know this NPC mm. when you come back to town like sort of approaches you and like confesses what he's done and that he's a bad guy maybe okay so you'd, you'd almost lost me for a second I was thinking oh that does feel like a layer too deep but no that's a perfect thing you, when you bring it around and say when your party is searching for that resolution and it's a real shame when you put in all this effort into something that may never get discovered. So it's nice to have an opportunity for mm. that to be dumped upon them over a beer or you know, at some place or next time they're buying some snake oil yeah, from the peddler or whatever it is. Yeah, good. I like that. That's a, a good way to communicate some of that information or even just like the story in general. They could piece it together from the back of that. Or it might give them enough of a tip-off to say, we should go check out the Wizard's Tower. There might be some cool stuff. Also, yeah. Cool. Right. Anything else you want to touch upon running a green slard? I don't think so. I think that's that's all I want to get across. We've got the the core where it comes from, what it's about. Uh, we sort of meandered around that a little bit. We got all the core points that we needed to set mm -hmm. up this scenario. Um, and I like how we've developed it. It's a shame that we don't get to run it with our groups. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which they've complained about, but yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, I'm I'm satisfied. I have. Well, I'm, I'm glad enough. you're satisfied. Yeah, I feel uh, we've built something quite nice there. Yeah, that feels like it's going to be more than a single session, to be honest. I think mm. there's a few ways that that could derail and become multiple sessions if the party decide to um, do some more investigation beforehand, or if they trip across the tower and investigate that first. Fine. But certainly, session two, if they haven't come back to the town yet, session two is when it will go down no matter what. Yeah, I like it. It's a nice little self-contained adventure. That's it. And then they've got an opportunity to get a little magic item or two out of the wizard's tower if they go there. And mm. we're, we're just talking spell scrolls, basic thing. So they're not feeling like the, the adventure was worthless. No, definitely. It's exciting. Mm. Nice. That's what you say. A little self-contained jobby. The party are making their way through the Spring Fest crowds in the Toonsburg Market Square when they spot a distinctive dwarven girl causing a ruckus over at some tat seller's stall. She briefly makes eye contact with Snips, 
and she sees her take something small from her mouth and plunge it into the ground at her feet. Five seconds later, an enormous beanstalk erupts out of the ground, destroying the stall and sending red crystals, dream catchers, and the popular scattered into the air. The dwarf girl, Taffeta, dashes off into the crowds. Snips immediately scales a nearby pole, hung generously with coloured bunting to try and spot the girl amidst the panicked crowd. Catching a glimpse of the striking blonde pigtails, she calls out to the rest of the party, She's heading that way! Fortescue and Vestel struggle to give chase, being pushed and buffeted by the crowd as they try and make their way through. Crunk sighs, levels an arm with his brow, and charges forward, knocking people clear and affording the party a route through the chaos. The chase continues, with Snips calling out every change in direction. Before long, there's another huge crash as a tree ant bursts into existence. Thankfully, it seems to be a fairly placid one. Coordinating as best she can, Snips directs the party members in a pincer movement, limiting the escape paths for Taffeta. Finally, she cuts a length of bunting and swings down into the crowd, blocking the final exit and trapping Taffeta in a stubby alley. The rest of the party arrive on the scene, and it's Fortescue who speaks first. Little girl, drop those beans! They're incredibly dangerous! For the first time, the girl looks as though she might actually speak. But instead, an unearthly, guttural speech comes forth. <laughs> Dropping the polymorph, the true shape of the swollen green slard is revealed. In a flash, it turns and hurls a gout of flame towards the party, causing them to dive aside, and it attempts yet another escape into the crowd. Okay, importantly then, need yes. to know mm -hmm. what's on the cards for next week. Okay, I rolled a couple of dice, because what we haven't done yet, I don't think we've properly delved into an item. So, I went flicking through some tables, rolled a couple of dice, and for next week, I would like you to tell me, Lucas, portable hole. How would you run that? Okay. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of our D&D podcast, How Would You Run That? Please give a like, a subscribe, wherever it is you get your podcasts. In particular, it'd be great if you could leave us some comments on iTunes and voice notes on the Anchor platform, anchor.fm. Spread the word, and we'll speak to you again next week. Thanks, everyone. Catch you later.